Why don't you think the, the newer generation of artists are interested or seem to want to embrace the history of the others who came before them to essentially get them to where they're at now? You know, that old saying, you got to know where you came from to get a better understanding of where you're going. You know, our past is, is the foundation. And I think the young people are more, you know, inquisitive today. You know, we got Google and, 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 and the Internet and, and they're finding out a lot of different things. So that that uh, that history is important. You know, the foundation is important. Um, and I think they're just, just they just want to know, you know, uh, people want to know where they came from, you know, who's my daddy type thing, you know, uh, people want to know their history and their past. You know, we have uh, but the genealogy uh, test and, and different things where people are going way back to their ancestors and Africa and Europe and different places, you know, find out where they came from. And it's the same with, with music. What's the foundation of our music? You know, I'm a drummer. So I like going back. I listen to all the old drummers and and that's how I got my particular style of, of, of playing percussion. I listened to you know, Joe Morello and, and Buddy Rich and, and all the, the different drummers of the past, Bill Maxwell, and put my own style together. And I think a lot of the young people that are in, uh, in music, and in particular Christian hip hop and rap, they want to know the foundation, you know? And so I think it, it's, it's, that's where we are in history today. A lot of artists in, in all types of music, actually, they always think like, the generation or two before them is like corny or less than it's like, you know, the new school hip hop. Oh, I don't want to listen to that golden era hip hop or even rock and roll and stuff that was like in the sixties. And you have people now it's so advanced, you know, the type of like artistry that they have. And they're like, why do I want to listen to the Beatles? Like none of that makes sense to them. So how do you, in, in your opinion, take this golden era of CHH and that sound and what you guys were doing and kind of package it in a way to show this generation that, hey, like as cool as you guys might be and stuff now, like that was us back then. And, and this is why, and this is why it's important. <laughs> it, it, you know, I, I look at, a lot of times you can look at what the world is doing to see what, what the spirit of God desires to do. But a lot of times Christians are slow to grab it. You know, you look at many of your secular rappers, what did they do? They went back and they sampled James Brown back in the 60s and the 70s. And they, they sampled Rick James and the different ones. You know, they went back in history and brought it forward. And even my message to uh, young people that want to get into, uh, in fact, I had some, some young people, we did a big rap concert and, and I'm the old school guy. And we had some of the young people come that were, you know, wanting to get in rap. And so, I, in fact, I gave them all a copy of all my music and they took it home and listened to it and they all came back and said the same thing it's like we get it now we know the foundation now because my foundation what i always wanted to, to to share with them was it's not about the beat it's not about all the pyrotechnics and all that you know it's about the word of god take the scripture and put it in to the rap style of music you can talk about your testimony but it's not the beat, it's but the word. The Bible says the word will not return void. And so all the young people I try to engage, I point them to the Bible, I point them to the word of God. And they, they all say the same thing. We get it now. And I see them kind of switching their attitude. You know, we all need an example before us. None of us get to where we are by ourselves. Somebody had to open the door, lay a foundation. And uh, uh, like my first song uh, that I did, Bible Break, I go through all the books of the Bible, right, from Genesis Revelation. Where I got that from, I was inspired by uh, a, 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 a pastor named Happy Caldwell and the Agape Singers out of Nashville. They were, they were Southern gospel, but he had a song called The Books of the Bible. And I learned that, you know, as a teenager. So I kind of, you know, took that and incorporated, well, he's Southern gospel, you know, old guy. And here I am, a you know, 17, 18, 19 year old African American kid at Oklahoma University, and I'm listening to Southern Gospel by old white dude, <laughs> you know. But I stole that, and brought it forward, and I hope somebody will take what I've done and I'll take it to the next level. Yeah, that's great, man. And you said the word uh, attitude in there, and that word is forever changed uh, for me because of your song. 
and watching you perform it live and doing the sound check with attitude, just singing the attitude. Now, every time I hear that word, I think of, I think of your song and it gets stuck in my head. So even all these years later, this is, this is your impact on me with your attitude song. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I always want the songs to have a message. And as I said, I was a youth evangelist, man, for like 27 years and doing youth ministry and motivating young people. And back in the, gosh, 80s, late 80s, going into the 90s, you know, I, I said there were several kind of young people. There was musical youth and designer youth. The musical youth, you know, they knew at the time, this is, this is 80s and 90s. I used to say they knew more about Michael Jackson than Jesse Jackson, you know. They knew more about Prince than Principal. Those were the musical youth. They could recite all the words to every song Michael Jackson ever done. And then you had designer youth. You know, they knew more about Calvin Klein than Einstein. And so they thought if I got this that designer attitude, or I got this musical attitude, you know, that's, that's who I am. I said, no, Jesus is the attitude. And that was the whole idea of even putting that song together. So you 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 had told me a while back that you were working on new music, whatever, what had ever happened with that? Still working on it. Still working I, on it? I'm, extre I'm extremely busy, man. I, I'm wearing I too many hats. I, uh, I'm a college professor, uh, where I teach full time. I'm director of Christian Ministry Center at Bacon College, which is the oldest college in Oklahoma. It was founded as a, uh, originally Indian University. It's the oldest college in Oklahoma, founded as a ministry by the American Baptist Church to the Native American people. In 1880, it was against the law to educate Indians in Indian territory. So Alma Bacon came out of here from the American Baptist Church and started Indian University, later named it after him, Bacon College. So I'm there full time teaching young people to get into ministry. I pastor Muskogee uh, Praise Center Family Church and Tulsa Praise Center Family Church. And I do part time at uh, Solid Foundation Preparatory Academy where my six-year-old granddaughter is in second grade. So I'm busy, man. This, this so sounds like more work. Class. Sounds like more yeah. work than actually touring. Yeah, that's <laughs> what I'm saying. I, uh, well, the interesting part of it with the college, they use my celebrity as it were. You know, we have flyers that we send out that say, hey, Steve Wiley, gospel rap pioneer is going to be at such and such a high school and you need to come. And so kids show up at the high school. I do my rap presentation. And then I say, hey, you want to go to college? Minister the word of God and give them a college education. But I've got music, man, in my vault, as it were, that, you know, I was telling somebody today, the Bible break went through all the books of the Bible. I got a song that I wrote years ago, which will probably be my next release. Uh, it, go, it teaches the Ten Commandments. It goes through all the Ten Commandments. So when a young person learning it, they're learning the Ten Commandments. I got another song I wrote called Christian Girl. Every Mother's Day, my mother would come to our church and because she was she was traditional Methodist, but she'd come to the Pentecostal church and I would do that song for my mother and for my wife and just give you a, a peek about it. The name of the song is Christian Girl. The thing about a Christian girl, you know, she's kind of hard to find. It really blows your mind when you meet one with all the qualities of God's son. And she's the only one that can read a good scripture in the time of need. It doesn't matter what the color, what the race, the creed. That's the only type of woman I want in my world, a Holy Ghost filled Christian girl. So I've got some songs I'm ready to bust out with. It just won't be long. We're waiting, man. We're waiting. And uh, my, my final question to you is, what when you know when it's all said and done and people look back at your career and, and your impact, what do you want them like what would you want your legacy to be? The word of God. I want my music to reflect the word of God. And I've had young people come up to me and they're reciting my rap songs. So, oh man, I heard that scripture, or I read that scripture in Ephesians, or I read that scripture in Psalms, or I read that scripture. I try to put as much scripture. Even the song uh, that I just did, uh, Christian Girl, it, it, it has a line, Proverbs 31, 26, to my surprise, a Christian girl is wise. Young fellas, open your eyes. See, I always put scripture in there so young people say, oh, Proverbs 31, 26, and they flip over there and find it, you know? So I want them to remember me for putting the word of God first. Awesome. It, indulge me for one more second. This is, this is me being uh, 
just trying to be funny. You come face to face with Curtis Blow. What's the first thing that's coming out of your mouth? Praise the Lord, brother. Has anybody told you today you are loved and appreciated? <laughs> that's what I'm going to say. You know, I have had opportunities. Uh, in fact, he's had opportunities for us to get together. And I've been told, you know, he didn't want to talk to me. That's what I've been told. I don't know. But people that know him and, and know me, you know, uh, you know, but I understand he's born again now. He's preaching the gospel. So maybe he's doing some of my other song now. Maybe he's got the right attitude. That would be funny. He's like, yeah, I have this new song called the called the Bible Breaks. <laughs> Wait a second. What's what's going on, man? You're going to have to come to blows with Curtis Blow if that happens. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, I'm not going to come to blows. No, we'll, we'll get that far. But as I say, he's a Christian brother. So, you know, uh, it is what it is, man. See, but here's the good part for me. I sincerely believe if I had gone in that direction, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. We wouldn't be talking. I wouldn't right be now. doing what I'm doing. Yep. We wouldn't be talking. But thank God, God flipped the script and made me a, a pioneer in Christian rap. And I'm, I'm thanking him for it. Thank you. Thank you for in, indulging that question. Um, Stephen, always a, a pleasure to speak to you. I'm glad I can actually speak to you in, in your your own office under your plaque. That's really cool. And uh, uh, man, just best wishes with everything moving forward. I know you got a lot going on. And whenever that music is ready, let me know. I'm here. You'll be the first to know, man. I got your number. Okay. Did a little digging and, you know, I read that when you first started out and actually maybe for the majority of your career, like your whole like reliance of your rap career was that God would provide and that you did things for free. So yeah. how difficult was that? How, how did you eat? How, how did you, how did you survive the, the streets of New York? There, there are two ways to answer that. Cause there are two ways of looking at it. Um, uh, the, the first one was, and I have to, I have to, at the very front end of this, you know, um, uh, pay tribute to my wife, Julia, for walking a distance with me with all of that. Um, because she knew, she knew even before she was ever my girl, the guy that called me and she watched the life of faith that I had lived before we ever dated, you know? And so, you know, so she kind of knew what she was getting into before this all, you know, before we got married and before all of this started. That's the first part. But the second part of it is, um, uh, I always tell people, that whenever the Lord speaks and the Lord works out a, a deal with you or a partnership, if you will, if there's anyone that's going to uphold their end of the deal, it's the Lord. And so we knew that as long as the Lord is going to uphold the end of the deal, we could just go right along with that. No matter how challenging um, the, our experiences may have been, we knew that the Lord was going to see us through those things. They were, they were very challenging. Um, for instance, we would go someplace. And, you know, I would, I would do like, like speaking like 12 school in one week, 12 schools, four juvenile detention centers, two prisons, um, and a youth group. And, um, and at the end of the week, you know, they might, might, and I, I emphasize might give us $300 and they would bring in one artist for one night for a 50 minute set and pay them like $7,000. And it's like, you know, we sold as many units as the, that artist that they brought in. Um, but, the, you know, we said, you don't have to pay us. But that didn't mean, please abuse us. You know, it was just that we did not want people to feel the pressure to have to pay us if it meant them giving us an opportunity to bring the good news of Jesus to people who needed to hear it. And so um, that so the, the challenge was there. But um, the Lord has come through. The Lord came through. And to this very day, still coming through, um, you know, for us in that manner. But uh, because we knew that we were not supposed to charge. Um, uh, my agent at the time, Frank Caserta, he went to be with the Lord in 2006. Um, uh, Fred got to the point where um, he was like, he says, Mike, I'm almost offended if somebody at calls and asks me, how much will you cost? You know, he says, because we're seeing God come through. And we would go places though, not charge, and they would, you know, financially um, bless us uh, with, with, you know, they would take care of us, and, you know, a nice place to stay and things like things like that. And there were many times 
they didn't even think about it, you know, about taking care of us. But um, we got through it all. And, it, you know, the, the, I think a lot of it was, and God be praised for this. I, I'm not I'm not trying to sound so spiritual, you know, um, that, that these, you know, we just like, you know, just popped it off of our shoulder. But um, God, God be praised that we had the spiritual maturity and the social maturity that we were able to handle the things that we were faced with when it came to the treat the treatment that we were not getting or were getting, however you want to look at it. But uh we made it. We made it. You're still here, right? You're that's you're, right. You're still rapping. You you're rapping tomorrow. Uh yeah. you know, a, a lot of a lot of people talk about or or they get upset now when you know um Christian music brings up, you know, politics or race or things that are happening. And they're like, I just just let me hear about my Jesus in the music or you know, whatever. But like you were actually doing that too, back in the eighties. So what kind of pushback, feedback, blowback, like were you getting back then for, for talking about some of these issues? If, if any, well, it, it's, it's kind of interesting because um, 90 plus percent, it's hard for people to believe this, but 90 plus percent of the time that uh, my wife and I were traveling the country and other parts of the world, we were in front of unsaved audiences. Um, and so um, we did not really get an opportunity to, to experience some of that criticism that many of the rappers were getting um, in Christian hip hop uh, because we were in front of people who knew they were going to hell. They knew that they were in desperate situations. And at the crux of what we, what we were doing as a ministry was that very thing, was to bring, you know, was, was to bring, you know, water to dry land. And, and, and so, we didn't really, you know, when, when we would do juvenile detention centers, you know, I'd do four or five songs and I'd bring the gospel, but make it really relative, rel, you know, relevant. And, um, you know, we were given altar calls like everywhere we went, you know, even in public schools. I, I did, I, I, this happened more than once, but there was one particular time I, um, I spoke in a public school and, you know, just like Johnny was saying how you can't say certain things, but, you know, I, I did, I did, I spoke the word, I just didn't say where it came from. So everybody was like, yo, that was kind of deep what you were saying up there. And it's like, it was scripture, but they didn't, I didn't say it was the word of God. And um, I was done with one, I was doing, we're done with one, doing one school and the principal who was a, a Christian, she came back up and she said, um, you know, and she said this in front of the whole student body. She said, you gave a really good story, but it didn't, you missed out on one piece. And I'm looking at her. She says, you didn't give anybody a chance to give their life to Jesus so they could be like how you are. And I went, okay, you know? And um, I went back up on the stage. There were 800 students there. I went back up on the stage. I shared the gospel. You know, the, you know, the four spiritual laws as we used to say back in the day. I gave an altar call right there. About 150 kids came forward to give their life to Jesus for the first time in a public school in Detroit. Um, and so we were just always in those kind of situations. So um, so when I would speak about, you know, those quote unquote political issues and, you know, social commentary, you know, people were connecting and just like Johnny was saying, and, and I've always had, I've always had a, a bone to pick with, with, with secular rappers in that way, because my thing was, uh, well, my first, my best example was when the song by Grandmaster Flash and the Fierce Five MCs came out, it was called the message, and it, you know, and the hook was, you know, it's like a jungle sometimes. It makes you wonder how we'll keep from going under, and, you know. And they go, all the way, go all the way through the song, and everything that they said was on point. And you know, I'm listening to this, and I'm like, well, this is life in New York City, but I live the life in New York City. I know what he's talking about. It's no big deal, you know. It gets to the end of the song, and it's just the end of the song. It's like I, did, I don't, I did not need anybody to tell me what life is like in New York City. I could have walked out of my front door and saw the song unfold before my very own eyes. Go to go, just get in the subway, get on the bus, and I could have seen what they were talking about. So I did not have to spend any money for that. Give me something uh, to, to sink my teeth into. And so that was not happening. And, you know, and just like Johnny was saying, you know, we had the answer, you know, I had the answer. And so, so whether I was in a prison, juvenile detention center, you know, um, you, you name it, working with the Crips, the Bloods, the Cholos, the Latin Kings, the El Rookins, it was always, yeah, 
I know what y'all are talking about. I'm feeling y'all and everything. But I have an answer for y'all above all of this nonsense. And that's pretty much how we came forward. What would you, um, when it's all said and done, what do you want to be remembered by? What do you want your legacy to be? To, to be known as, as a brother that understood what, what, what was going on in the, you know, going on in the world or the nation, right? And um, was unapologetic about bringing the good news of Jesus Christ in response to all of it. Um, I, I want to be, I want to be remembered, and hopefully that's what people think of me. Some say it now to me, but I want to be remembered as the brother that that uh, was not ashamed of the gospel, could bring it, but also in such a way that it was engaging to the people listening, even to those who originally did not even want to hear anything that I had to say. The ID, uh, I feel like you you guys steadily evolved in your sound and got better and better. Now, yeah. was, was that more of a way to kind of keep up with how hip hop was changing over the years or was PID legitimately like, hey, it's a new year and we're better artists now, like we're learning and, and we keep going? Well, I, for me personally, I had a philosophy that I'm an artist. And so uh, I, I remember like having a, an infatuation and a love for hip hop. But I also remember like the time, the moment that I fell in love with hip hop and, and in, in any kind of art, like uh, if I can use it in a metaphorical term, you know, you fall in love with that spouse and you just want to become better. Every, every, every day is a new day, you know, and the only thing that I'm challenged with is how did I love you yesterday? OK, how can I top? However, I loved you yesterday. I want to love you that much more. And so every year, yeah, as rap continued to evolve, we continue to strive to evolve. And so much where we started out, like I remember starting out and there were no Christian DJs. There were no Christian like producers. And especially in when we started out in the late 80s, like, you know, we it was taboo to even get with someone that was quote unquote not a Christian to do your beats. You know, so a lot of it, we tried, we just kind of learned on our own. I was a kid, I'm a nerd as well. So I was a kid learning the drum machines and the samplers and all of that. And, uh, you know, our first album, we had some people do a lot of the stuff for us. Our second album, we trusted some people that the record label said, trust us, we got some people that'll give you some of that deaf sound you want. By the time we got to our third album, we were like, look, yo, don't even ask we'll do it ourselves so as as we continue to grow we just continue to evolve with the art form and the art form was good to us we wanted in turn to be good back to the art form i know how hard it was to tour you know as a solo artist back then i remember you guys just talking about you know barely having any money and sometimes people would be like like yo why the heck are we doing this i'm out so like how much how much harder was it i guess for the for people who are watching this to actually tour as a group when you have multiple mouths to to feed and multiple people with families and uh, different arrangements because you need bigger space. You know, what, yeah. what was that like? Well, if anything, you could say it was definitely hustle. It was serious hustle you had, but it was a, a, a com combination of like serious hard hustle, but serious love for the art form. Like you had to really like love the art form enough to where like life would get so hard the bills would be so high that you're like, yo, I'm going to quit. It's, it's, it's answer to your question. You know, he was asking how, you know, you know, as a solo artist, it was hard to go out there and make it. How in the world did you guys make it as a group? And I said, it was two things. It was, it was mad hustle, it was serious hustle. And it was serious love. Like there would be plenty of times where we just said, I'm quitting. I've told you three or four times I'm quitting. And, 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 and he was like, okay, I quit. And I'll see you in the morning. At eight o'clock, because we're gonna quit tonight. I'm gonna quit over the weekend. Monday morning, we're gonna be back at this. Or it would be something like this, especially when we're talking about the love of the art form. You'd hear somebody do something, bring something new out, an album, and then that 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 you that inspired. thing you get inspired, and you're like, you know what? I gotta figure a way out. I'm just gonna work two extra jobs. I'm gonna I'm gonna sell some extra t-shirts, you know, on the side. And a lot of what uh, what really made us was the hustle and was the love, you know. So we had the love for the art form, 
uh, going out there rocking real shows, really, really becoming great MCs in our own sense and in our own right, and then just finding a way to make it. So that has been what we have doing. I mean, it's, that's that's what an artist does. One of the things that I'm actually really interested in is, you know, you guys spent like a decade or more. And a lot of you guys spent this time touring as Christian hip hop artists, trying to create something that didn't exist. So like when you guys stopped, said, okay, we're not going to do this anymore. Like what was next? Like, what did you guys do next? You had just spent all this time creating something, building something. Then what did life look like after hip hop and touring and ministry? Only ask a couple of ways. There's a couple of ways you can hit that. Uh, uh, one way I'll say the first one is for, for, for me, uh, what I said is I'll stop doing it probably on this platform. In in a real, real sense for my life, I've been blessed. I've never stopped doing what I was doing. I just do it in different venues and in different platforms. So I st- I've been right. <laughs> I, I, I traveled. I was blessed to be able to, to travel for close to 15 to 20 years, even if it's just traveling, speaking in camps and speaking at schools and, and doing, going and just doing it. So it's like it's never stopped. I just necessarily didn't do it in particular venues. So that was one for me. Um, and so I just continued to do it. And so it just like I said, just continue hustling continue loving the craft and loving the art and just doing it. That That's kind of my answer. Either one of y'all? Yeah, well, I, I would concur. I never stopped either. It was just a different um, a level of the gospel rap. I moved to Dallas during the time of our time together. And what I was able to do was to start an independent label um, and at the same time promote some of the other up and coming um, individuals and groups that were were at that time, 96, 97, cross movement was beginning to get hot. I had the opportunity to, to bring them to the Dallas Fort Worth area. KJ52 was hot, was able to bring him down. Um, Corey Red and Precise. So there were different artists. And so the platform for me changed to where I was able to, to help to promote what the next tier of of artists were in a particular region that was different from you know my hometown as far as New York was concerned. And I, as Fred said, you know, it was just different platforms that I continue to 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 do what I do as far as being an MC, being a minister and things of that nature. And of course it and so far as the profession of things, you know, God's hand on the, the situation was it opened up for me becoming a, a youth pastor and then going on to become a senior pastor. So um but the artistry and, and and all of that 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 didn't stop. It just it didn't stop. So, and that may be a shift because you did some some, some different so as far as like with, when you were doing a chef, you was doing it in school. So well, like for 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 me, you know, as far as when when the touring was over, it was a little bit different because when I was with PID when we were together on the road, I had three young children and a wife that was pregnant. Right. And so uh, when I left the road, it was because, uh, you know, I had to go and, and take, take care, care of my family. family. Yeah. Like, uh, mm-hmm. You know, uh, so I've always been a performer. So what I, what I just did was I just changed my performance to a, to a, to a better father. And um, mm-hmm. I'm a chef and now I perform in kitchens and people's homes and, in restaurants and, and, and all those type of things. So, um, but you know, now I'm back in Dallas. Just moved back to Dallas in May, and and, and linked up with Fred and, and and Rich, and you know, we just been doing what we've been doing. Just letting the Lord just lead and guide what the next steps uh, are for us. I mean, I think we all have a pretty good, stable work environments yeah. where you know we can take care of our families mm-hmm. and stuff like that and you know now the next best thing next thing is you know what's next yeah um you know amongst all of us so you know as a person that had to go you know because it was tough mm-hmm. it was real hard. real hard it was really really hard but um you know now you know we're older i'm here and and, and this is a great great opportunity to do this so you know we'll continue and i know i'll continue to do the things that i'm good at which mm-hmm. is running my mouth so <laughs> as as you were coming up through music and and kind of being the first people to do things along with you know your you know your contemporaries did you guys know that that you were making history or doing something that down the road people were going to look back and say hey 
you know, who is the first person to do this? Or who is the first group to do that? Or, you know, walk these lands that were never walked before? It's a great question. Uh, I would probably say just like most people that did it. Yeah, we had no clue. We were just young and dumb. <laughs> you know, just <laughs> let's get out and do it. I remember being probably about 19, 18 or 19 years old. I remember being on the backside of the Bible school that I went to. They had a track in the back of the Bible school. And I remember walking that track and praying. I used to pray on the backside of the track back in the woods. And I remember being in the woods once and saying and listening to some rap and saying, God, somebody's got to do some Christian rap where kids, when they're, when they're, you know, all of us love to rhyme. When kids are rhyming, they can rhyme on something that's going to be good, that's going to be positive. That's the word of God. Somebody's got to do that. And I, and I like to say it like this. I used to say, and God spoke to me. And, and, and I think he did. But uh, I, I like to say it like this in a humble way of just saying, I think God spoke to me. Uh, when I look at, you know, 30 years later, I really much more do think it was. But I think that God said right then, so why don't you do it? Why don't you do it? And I was like, okay, let's go. Let's do, let me try it. And of course I was scared. Of course I was like, is this going to work? Of course I was like, I don't know if anybody's getting this. Uh, I tried to shift a lot of times. I shifted the way that I look at stuff. I'm an optimist just by nature. I really am. And so as a result, like I thought, you know what? I may not get a Grammy, but if I get a granny <laughs> telling me, baby, and I've had this before. I've had grannies come up to me and say, baby, I don't understand what you said, but I know, I know you making a difference. Partner, that was my Grammy. Yes, sir. That was it. I was like, that's all I need and let's go. And so I did not, we did not know that we were like the, the first ones to do this, the first ones to do that. I know that we, so, so like a lot of people told us why it can't happen and why it shouldn't happen. Ooh. But, you know, we just saw a lane and we were like, let's just go for it. We got energy. We're young. We didn't know, you know, how many ways you can fail. Right. So we were just like, let's just go do it. Yeah, there's a chance you can fail, but there's a chance you can make it. Let's go. And so we went out there and did it. Like looking back in, at, at your careers, what, what you did individually, what you did as a group, what would you want um, your individual uh, legacies to be? Like, what do you want people to remember you by when they look back and they look at PID and your, and your body of work? Um, you know, what I would want my, my legacy to be as far as being a member of PID is that the kids uh, in my youth group at the time when I was a youth pastor, and you know, started rhyming just to get them something else to do. Besides, we had to, you know, they wanted to, we wanted to take away the street rap, but you had to have an alternative. So the alternative was let's do something to get these kids connected. So um, just my legacy would just be, you know, those those kids, you know, that are grown now, you know, that are living, you know, their lives the way they want to live, their lives, and, and and you know, serving the Lord. The majority of them are. Um, and, and one form of another is just that I did something to try to just change a kid's life. And for the most part, the Lord did the work. I planted it. I put the seed in and, and, and the Lord watered it and the Holy Spirit brought it out. And that's what I, you know, whether anybody else ever sees those kids, I know they're out there and I know they exist. So that's what I want my legacy to be as far as a Christian rapper. And I think that's where it's at. Sin, sin, sin. They, they talk about you getting, you know, giving individuals their flowers while they're alive. And I think when we talk about legacy, from my perspective, it's not too far off from what Jay is saying. There's a lot of young people, you know, that when you think about the alternative and giving them the alternative and, and then being one gifted to do it, not just because you're just trying to do something, right. but you're gifted to do it and then to see the fruits of that labor. Um, that's already that's already a thing, and so the blessing of it is being on on a platform like this just to be able to remember and recall at the same time understand it did have an effect. It did have so for me it's like just keeping in mind that that call that you got that you didn't even know that it was a call, the gift that you had to be able to do this, the fun that you had while doing it, as well as the struggle, mm. 
the issue is the lives that were changed because of it and to be able to see that while you're still alive not only within your own family but then the, the, the extended family that God gives you through, you know, some dude or, or few person coming up to you saying, hey, I remember that song and da, 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 And you're like, where are you from? <laughs> you know, I mean, that that's that's an awesome sense of accomplishment that when you speak about legacy while you're here, it's, it's just it's just it's a payoff. It's, it's a payoff. Like you said, it, that's your grand. Mm-hmm. That's grand. Uh, for oh, me, oh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I'd like a Grammy. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll get a Grammy if I sound like that. Wouldn't we all? <laughs> How I love you. How I love you. <laughs> I want one of them. We didn't say man. We didn't say man. I want one of them. Participation <laughs> Grammys. Right. <laughs> Good job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which <laughs> Love to those that get the Grammys and all of that. That's good, you know. Um, I, and for me, I would say this: you know, the five albums, PID, five of the five albums that we did, and then after that, I worked on a project, and it was, uh, and it was just a dream. It was a crazy dream of mine to take the Book of John and put it into rap, verse by verse. And so I did the entire. It took me like th- two and a half, almost three years to actually pin into hip hop language and into spoken word every verse of the Book of John. And I remember the day that I finished it, that I finished it, and then I went out to go run, and I when I go out jogging, and I'm feeling really good, like I'm feeling kind of proud of myself, right? And so I, I kind of say this under my breath, what will Fred Lynch do next? And, and I think the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and I think this is what he said. I think he said, the next best thing that you can do is multiply yourself. Multiply yourself. And so when I think about my legacy, like I remember when we first started and I looked around and thinking whoever did anything as crazy as we're doing, like hip hop. And there were a couple of people that did some crazy things in different venues or genres, like Leon Patillo was out there, like doing doing his thing in sequence and, you know, J-E-S-U-S, you know, but he was doing his thing, right? Res band, resurrection band. Man, I remember going to a res band, and if anybody like imprinted on me to put leave it all on the stage when you do a show, Glenn Kaiser freaking resurrection band. I, I wasn't even into rock and roll. He pulled me into rock and roll because I saw him on stage and I was like, that's how you do a show. Right, right. And it was all from God. And so it was several people. I didn't know these people, but they were legends to me. If I want anything from my personal legacy, I would hope that people do like I did with them. I stood on their shoulders, even though I didn't know them. I knew their legacy. I saw what they did. I said, "Okay, they get that. I'm going to stand on that and I'm going to take it further. If there's anything that I would love to see happen is I would love to see someone take what I've done and take it further. Take the baton and go further. Do better than I ever could have done. And uh, and let's glorify God together in the end. I think that's the key, though. You know what I'm saying? Because there's a lot that a lot of individuals that are taking it further. That's it. But that last part, I think that that becomes key. Bringing glory to God. Yep. Your God's that's glory. Where, the that's end. where the ultimate influence comes yep. from yep. in regards to well, why you're doing what you're doing. You're trying to get a Grammy. You're trying to get paid. You're trying to be a superstar. You could do that. That's not taking it further. That's just doing what everybody else is doing. What everybody else is doing. I'm saying so. Yeah. Yeah, that. So that's what's up. Yeah. That's what's up, Jay. That's what's up. Aren't you glad the Holy Spirit didn't tell you to do uh, the book of Numbers next? Is that- <laughs> <laughs> Leviticus. Leviticus and, numbers. And or- Leviticus and emo rap. <laughs> yeah, that would work now, maybe. Try it out. I prepared like a lot of these questions a long time ago, and I don't remember why I have this question here, but I'm going to ask it. I think it's for Fred. Who is, who is Doug Trey? Who is Doug Trey? Well, my middle name is Douglas. I'm a third. I'm Fred Douglas Smith's third. So Doug Trey, I'm Doug Trey. Okay. Uh, and for me, hip hop names for the longest, like I never did like my name coming up. Fred Lynch. That's just an oxymoron. The name Fred is a German name that means friendly. Lynch, we know what that means. Okay. And I just didn't like them. I thought I'm the second kid in my group, my family. Why did I come up? My dad's name is Fred, and his dad's name was Fred. And I just like, 
It's just a throwback name. Why do I have to have this name? I didn't like it. I wanted a cool name. And so in hip hop, when everybody was getting their special names, I thought, okay, I'm Doug, I'm a Trey, uh, Doug Trey. And I put that together and I lived with it and I liked it. But, you know, just like, you know, I like to joke around like Gandalf. We went from Gandalf the Gray to Gandalf the White. You know, I changed names for a while I was Son of Man or whatever. I think I'm all of those, but in reality, at the end, I, I'm Fred, I'm Fred Lynch. You know, so yeah, I'm Doug Trey and I'm Fred Lynch. And to some, I'm daddy. And to some, I'm baby, honey. Only to one, I'm honey, baby. <laughs> Make that right. Get that right. Good work, good work. <laughs> to one, I'm honey, baby. To, to two, I'm daddy. <laughs> to many, I'm just old Fred, you know. And, and to some, I'm friend, you know. So so I answer to all of those names, man. It was fun to do. And once again, for the love of the art, big shouts to uh, Gigi Rodriguez. Uh, still, we're going to do this one dedicated to all the fallen soldiers from QP to Solo to Mike to D-Boy. Much love because they rocking up in heaven. So, you know, we actually are a part of a community that transcends death. So we all going to rock tomorrow. Yes, so that's what's up. When you guys were forming ETW and and getting the beginning of that together, what was the the driving force that kind of made you guys say, hey, you know, I think we can do this rap thing and I think we can reach people. What like what do you guys think and, and how should we do this? You know what? Actually, we started off at uh, or Roberts University. Mm -hmm. uh, it was myself. Um, Elroy, um, and then um, a couple other people. We had so we were students actually. Right. We were kind of putting in for a. Um, it was it was basically just a. Um, it was a talent show, you know, and we just were putting together some things. Basically inspired by Stephen Wiley, to be totally honest with you. It is around 85, 86, you know, and we just say, hey, let's just do the rap thing and do a gospel rap similar to what he was doing, but we actually lost the contest. <laughs> Out of 10 contestants, we came in number 10, you know what I'm saying? You know, but, but but the thing is, um, we started it because we had about six, seven people in the group. And uh, we would go out in the community of Tulsa and just do things, you know, just free concerts where we did, you know, we could, we just really wanted to do something for God. So um, when my school days ended, um, it dwindled down to the three of us, you know, and uh, Mike joined the group a little later. And it dwindled down to the three of us. And then when we actually got the record contract in 89 or forefront, um, that's when things kind of took off on a more professional level. But we were doing a lot of local things, local churches, uh, prisons. We're doing it way before. I, I think we got up to, um, so you guys, when you signed with forefront, and then I kind of started losing you there. Okay. Yeah. I was mentioning that we were doing a lot of ministry before forefront. You know, that was... That was more of an, a blessing to extend what we really felt we needed to be doing because we saw the effect of how, how the you know the spoken word, how gospel music can transform lives just by we would literally go out in the projects and just be doing stuff. You know what I mean? But to have it on a national scale where your music is all over the world was something that was just a major answer to prayer. But it extended what we were already doing. And and one of the, one of the things I noticed like as you put out music you know, with Forefront and later on, the, the early music was kind of like more fun, more upbeat. Right. Was, was that more so to kind of like appease the label and appease your audiences as they got acclimated, you know, to a hip hop group? You know, it was yes, yes and no. You know, because I think uh, some, some of the production choices we would have had different. We didn't have a lot of control over that. You know, because, um, you know, it's just the way we knew artists, we didn't have a lot of control over that. So uh, I mentioned before, the first two projects, we didn't have as much say-so as far as production as we would have wanted to. And, um, you know, so it wasn't until the third album, um, you really got more of what uh, you know, the target audience we were really trying to reach, because those were the places we were actually going. You know, we were going into public high schools, we were going into... Um, prisons, we were doing a lot of things with people who were dealing with real life situations. And not to say that the first two albums, they, they were some, you know, there were some good songs in there. But I mean, but we were, you know, doing tours with the Grand on Key, we were doing things with um, more of a very, very much so um, Christian, with really Christian, Christian audience. But the last few years of our ministry, we did a lot of things that um, 
put us right in smack in the public. You know, like I said, public high schools opened up. You couldn't go in there saying Jesus, 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 but you could say, um, you know, 40 in a blunt is what you want, you don't lose. You could say stuff like that. You could say things like, um, you know, some of the things that we were, we were rapping about, because those are the things they were really dealing with. You know, and uh, that's why it kind of geared in that direction. Plus, we have more control over our production. So it sounded a little bit more like what we actually sound like. If you saw us on the road, we would sound a little different than the actual album because we ended up remixing a lot of the music, mm -hmm. you know, to fit the audience we were dealing with, you know. So we have about three different sets, you know, like the set at the home church in Kansas City someplace. So we had another set, like in the street in Boston, and we had another set if we're in a prison, you know, we had three different sets to go on tour, you know, only to fit the audience that we were in front of. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense, especially when you're dealing with like that delicate balance of like, okay, we're in a church here, we're, we're in this, this is the type of people we're going to have here. Um, so did you feel though that, that that music that you did that was more geared towards what you wanted to and as you got further along that dealt with more, I guess, more like real issues, do you felt that was more received and that maybe the prior audience that kind of hung out for the, for the more happy stuff kind of went back and your message was received by the people who needed it? Thank you. When we first came out, the um, that's where we were. Because any in, with any group, there's a maturity as far as your writing. There's a, a maturity as far as your message. And where we were when we first started, we were demon slaying, you know, fight the devil. That's that's who we were. You know what I mean? That's what our message was, and that audience um, received it really well. But again, as we started really going out into um, mainstream dealing things you 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 kind of change your message in a way not not the um, effectiveness of the message but a, a pinpointed strike of who you're really trying to speak to you know what i mean and that was because like you know you couldn't walk into the ghetto and say say it's canceled they don't know what you're talking about you know what i mean but you can say that you know um you know, like i said you, you're smoking dope all this kind of stuff you, you can say that in a song and at the end of the song you're giving them crisis and answers to the issues are really dealing with, you know, because a lot of people point out the problems, and that's that's some of the issues that you dealt with. For like, I mean, like people gangster rappers, oh man, you know, it's messed up. This is the way. But at the end of the deal, you're not giving an answer to how they're gonna get out of it. All they're gonna do is shake their head. Yeah, man, you're right, you're right, you're right. But I'm gonna still go back to smoke this joint because, you know, you're not giving me an answer. You're not giving me any type of solution for the issues that I'm really dealing with. So what we were trying to do is trying to present the issue. We'll come up with a solution at the end of it. Because usually at the end of our son, there's a solution. That, that solution always points to Christ. You know, ain't nobody dying but us. We're talking about uh, issues with people, black on black crime. You know, yeah, people can uh, glamorize, you know, oh yeah, you know, smoke this dude, all this kind of crazy stuff. When people really are dying, when people really are going to funerals, you know, it's, it's a real thing. You know, when you're actually going into the community talking about it, they know exactly what you're talking about. And at the end of the at the end of the song, you're saying the only way you're really gonna get out of this lifestyle is through the price. You know, you don't have to go down like that. So that, that's that's what I mean. The audience kind of changed because we were getting a more realistic, um, in your face type situations. We had to come up with something to shut up. Yeah, no, that's great. And and I, I've been asking everybody this and, and kind of with with mic drop, um, kind of setting the precedent of you know, CHH and it being historical and what you guys doing uh, being important. So when it's all said and done and people look back at your, you know, your career in music and ETW, like what do you want your legacy to be? What do you want to be remembered as? Honestly, this is very humbling, you know, because um, in a sense of you do things um, not so much because you want to have all this big accolades and recognition. That, that wasn't our purpose until we were doing it because this is what God really put on our heart to do. But at the end of the day, if God's giving you a reward or giving you some, some type of uh, recognition of what you did, it's very much so appreciated because there was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that went into this. You know what I'm saying? And uh, it, yeah, it, it, feels, it feels good, you know, but at the same time, it's very humbling because you know, we always went into it with a humble kind of thing, you know, because we said, in your humility, that's what God will put you in front of so many different people. You know, we went in there arrogantly, like, yeah, man, I deserve this, whatever, this and that. We probably wouldn't have gotten anywhere. But in humility, that's what God was allowing you to be in front of a lot of different people, a bigger audience than we probably would have ever thought of if we really tried to do this ourselves. 
Gospel Gangsters was like the first Christian group to really embrace that West Coast like gangsta sound in the way that you did. And you guys were legit too because of your past. Like this was not a facade. So what was it like kicking in the doors of music the way you guys did? You know what, man? It's funny that you like say that because coming to these two mic drops, the second mic drop I'm at now, that was like everybody was talking about that. And like I tell everybody, you know, like I did PID and them and all them ups because, you know, we was like following them dudes. They was like kicking in doors. We just, you know, we came and mimic what they did and, you know, and did it the same. You know, we feel like this is how the believe was supposed to do it and bum rushing. A lot of times when we did the, did what we did, we didn't even like really think about it. Like, we weren't like thinking about like, oh, we finna do it this way, man. We was just, we was just trying to do whatever the father wanted us to do to see people change their lives. You know what I mean? So a lot of times, even right now, when people say, oh, remember this, you did this, you, I be like, I don't remember, bro, because it's, it's just like when you're in the midst of that and God got you in the midst of that, nothing else matters, you know what I mean? So kicking in them doors, we just felt like, this is what you're supposed to do, right? You're a believer. You're supposed to kick in doors. You're supposed to, you know, help people get born again. You know, you're supposed to show people what God is like, right? And and we would just, for us, it was by any means necessary, bro. We didn't care if we had to sleep in the car for three days to go tell somebody, sleep in the truck. We didn't care if we had to go to the prisons. We didn't care. It didn't matter for us. You know what I'm saying? We was just like everybody that we know that's ever been in a situation like me solo and uh, TikTok, like, you know, jail, you know, uh, shootings, you know, killings and mayhem and all that. If you, if, if, if the father can change us, he can change you. So that was, that, that was our whole get in for the whole thing. Like, man, as many as people we can let know about the father, that's what we need to do. And that was a part of, you know, our bum rush mentality. Like, we don't care where we go, you know, like you said, we used to go a lot of places like, we go to Chicago, places like that, to bring me greens, all the, and people be like, don't go over there. You know, it's bad over there. You, I was like, well, what God you serve? You know, because that's why I'm going to be at tomorrow. You know what I mean? So we did it fiercely, bro. We didn't have no fear. I still don't have none. I'll go anywhere, bro, and pronounce the, the name of the Father, bro. Jesus Christ lives forever, bro. And that's just how I go. Do or die, just like the album said. You don't, the, my mentality really don't change. Dope, man. I love, I love that answer. So with, with the commercial, I mean, you guys got a lot of commercial success and you got, you know, cosigns from mainstream hip hop. Was, was that surprising? Um, yeah, it was. Well, well, it was surprising because, you know, when you, when you grow up in the hood, you grow up in, in the ghettos, you, you know, you hear the ice cubes, you hear the snoops, you hear the drays, you hear the easy ease, you know, you hear the two pops, you hear the carriage ones, you, you hear those. And when, you know, when they, when you next to them and you've been listening to them forever, and then they look at you as a peer, it's, it's, a, it's a little, it's a little different. But at the same time, when you're talking about West Coast hip hop, most of them dudes is gangster and they really from the streets. So like you said with us, it, it was, it, you know, it was a true story. So when you got somebody like, you know, Coolio, you got somebody like Corrupt, you got somebody like Snoop from Long Beach. You got these all these dudes. That's where they from, and they see us and they look at us and they say, "Oh, them so some solidified Crips and Bloods right there." It was they tuck us in like, like just like everybody else, you know, like, "Oh, this is real," because trust me, if you if you're in the music game and you're fake, and you from the West Coast, somebody gonna tell the truth. You know, so because that's how it is. It's gangsta on the West Coast. It either is or it ain't. So you know that 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 was a blessing for us, like going in the spots that it was real and and, and that they recognized the God in us and they recognized God, even though like some of them would tell us like, "Chili baby, like man, I know we all should be doing what you're doing right now. We just caught up right here, but bro, we really know the real. You know, so you know, and that's been a blessing." To where you know some 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 dudes that's out there in the in the, um, in the industry they might even change their life, but just because I spoke the name of Jesus and Yahweh, just they seen it in another form, it made them want to at least get a little bit closer to. Me. So it's always a blessing just to shine that light, bro. No matter where I'm at. Yeah, man. And something I've been asking everybody um, when when you look back at your career 
in music whenever it's over what would you want uh the legacy or the or the memory of chili baby of gospel gangsters to be man i i would i would want the legacy to be that god used them to change so many lives and um be humble with it you know what i mean because for us when we got into it it was about changing lives so when i get out of it it's going to be the same about changing lives you know and I, I would want that to be our legacy my legacy that my music changed a, a lot of lives you know and helped a lot of people you know what i mean because that's what we get into this for you know a lot of people we didn't we didn't get into that for right for the money if we got in for the money, we being super duper chalupa rich. You know what I mean? But we didn't get in it for that. We got in it for the people. The gospel games be people, people, people. You know what I'm saying that's why we be like E40, my weeple you know I'm saying we people. And you you trim the beard? Is that what I'm nah, seeing there? It's it, not, nah, bro. It's tied up. Tucked, it's just tucked like a buck. That's all. Okay, I was about to say, do we got any like significance, any meaning behind this? But all right, you're you're still you're still yourself, so everything's good. Oh, bro, I'm still myself, bro. I'm still my feet, <laughs> bro. I'm not I'm not gonna chase anything, bro. I, I believe that the Father makes you procure you. He said we'll procure you people, so He makes you who you are. You know, nobody else can make you who you are except Him. So you know, your boy, you know, I'm an XD boy, man. You know that love the Father, bro. I'm an XD boy. I ain't gonna I ain't gonna never change, bro. I'm always populate. You know, this my thing, man. You know what I'm saying? Like I be telling them, y'all trap this, man. That means really, really big, man. God really, really big everywhere. <laughs> so you know, I you know, it's it's a lot of dudes out there that's like us. You gotta think of hip hop, the swagger, the way we act, the way we talk. You know, you got dudes that ain't that's not born again that talk like that, got that swagger like that, that think if I, you know, if I get if I get born again now, I gotta, you know, I gotta put my shoulders up and I got, you know what I'm saying? Like I, I can't, I can't hang loose, you know what I mean? But you know, the father makes you who you are, bro. And that's how people around the world get born again by everybody being their own person and having their own personalities. And whatever that lane that the father wants them to run, they run that, bro. And in the midst of that lane, no matter who you are in life, God is going to run those people to you. He's going to bring those people to you that he wants to come to you, bro. And that's why we all procure you, bro. That's why we all our own. So, Chitty Baby would never change, bro. Gospel gangster can't be republic to the death pot. How did you actually get involved with with this leg of the the mic drop, you know, experience? Um, well, when I found out about mic drop, um, I seen maybe a trailer or something like that. So I reached out to um, Core PR. I believe they're the ones that's handling mm -hmm. all the PR um, for mic drop because I wanted to get Darius on um, the God Chases podcast, and um, when he came on a podcast and before he did, I had a sneak peek of it, of the movie. And it, I was so impressed by it. And um, because me and Will Thomas has been working on some film stuff and I know him and Will know each other. And um, I just thought this was, this is, film is probably like one of the most important um, films for a fan of Christian rap, not only a fan of Christian rap, but, the church needs to see how far this this vehicle has come, you know, just using this vehicle to reach the lost, to um, change people's lives, you know, the vehicle to help out that this is a story that's not really being told. So I thought it was really important. And, that, and, after, and after that, I covered the um, Nashville Dallas stop on, on the podcast. And um, I really just, nobody asked me to really get behind it. But I really got behind um, Mike Drop, and because I believe in the message, and, and Stephen Wiley is is the first um, Christian hip hop artist I ever heard, and hearing him really changed the trajectory of my life. You know what I'm saying, and made me start rapping and, and touring. And, and today is actually the first day I got to meet um, Stephen Wiley. So I mean, just being here and a part of this this historic moment is this means a lot to me you're now sitting at his desk i'm sitting it's at like, his desk it's I'm like take, Dude, take, your, it's, take your sandals off you're on holy ground like it's <laughs> one of those moments right 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 so yeah man i mean I, i've spoken with him before because i you know i um 
I just told him the impact he's had over my life. I sent him some albums and things like that. And um, mm-hmm. this this is an important event. And I've, I've seen the coverage you did from the Dallas event, which I thought was extremely dope and it Thank needed you. to be on um, the Rapzilla platform. And I just was, I thought it was amazing. I've seen, you know, kind of your calls to on Twitter about this stuff, like, hey, we need to, you know, pay homage, we need to, you know, honor these people, how come we're not talking about these things. And like, that was, that's something I'm super passionate about, actually, is is just kind of history storytelling. You know, and I, I, and I love going back and, you know, I've told the Stephen Wiley story, D boy story, MC Gigi mm-hmm. story, um, now doing the mic drop stuff. So my question to you is, are, are there maybe, and this is, you know, off the top of your head, maybe three to five artists or certain moments in CHH that you think need like that mic drop experience that that needs like a deep dive that we need to tell that story. Absolutely. I mean, I can go as far as the 95 South tour, which had a core red precise, Richie Righteous, um, Minister Zion, that needs, um, coverage i've never been to rap fest but the stories i hear from rap fest are always amazing and i would just say the the journey of a, a petty d and a and of a canine like uh j- just to hear petty d's story about uh just how he came up in jacksonville because he's from my city you know what i'm saying and just see how god rose him out of a place called Lackawanna, which was like the, you know what I'm saying? It, it was rough in Lackawanna. And uh, just to see where God has taken him all over the world with the gospel is, I mean, it's a story. It needs to be a, a deep dive out um, and out. So let's see, canine life been crazy, you know, just, just to see it. He, he's an OG. Um, and I would say somebody like a, a Jehaziel, like even though he's not in the faith, I've had extensive conversations, his contributions to Christian rap, even though he's not that. And I'm praying that he comes back, you know, that the Lord directs him back. But I think he's another guy that just needs to have his story told because, you know, even though he's not where we want him to be as, as believers, but the things that the Lord allowed him to do was extraordinary. You know, how, how do you think, that you are able to, you know, help bridge the gap between the older generation and the newer generation as someone who's kind of like in between it? I think, I think my way musically is because every album I have a a Stephen Malcolm and then I have a Petty D because I know I still have, have a really good reach and a really strong fan base, but I want to show them who was before me and who's coming up now who people need to keep their eyes on. And I'm all, I think of myself as a connector. And I think I always try to hook people up with each other and say, hey, this guy's dope. You need to hook up with them. And then if I'm at a ministry, I'm not one of those guys who who, who is not going to tell about another artist. I'm always trying to open a door for somebody else. I just believe that if if I so open doors for people, God to keep opening up doors for me. And I think that's one of the things that's that's allowed me to have so much longevity. So trying to connect people, connect people uh, with artists, with ministries that they don't know about. Because I go to cities and this cities that I've been to haven't heard of anybody on Rapzilla. You know what I'm saying? And they'll be like, oh, you're the first Christian guy I heard of. I'm like, well, praise God. But I'm not the only one. There's an army of us out here, you know? All right. My last question to you is when, you know, when it's all said and done for you, how do you want people to remember uh, your legacy? That's a deep question, Justin. Yeah. Sorry. You only, you only got like 30 seconds to answer. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I, I, I want to be remembered as a guy who chased God, um, who allowed the the power of God to flow through them and through the music. Like I I really believe that the anointing of God can flow through the music because I've seen it time and time again as somebody who always, no matter what, pointed people to Jesus. Like I'm that guy who would say Jesus 16 times in the 16 bar. You know what I'm saying? So I just want to be remembered as somebody who loved people, loved hard, tried to encourage others and point people to Jesus over and over and over again. Do you feel like 
you know, the more events you're doing and, and the more kind of, I guess, light that's been placed on this project, do you feel like things are somewhat uh, changing for you or, or changing for the culture in general? Um, so more so for the, for the culture, I mean, obviously for me, um, but I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be serving God no matter what, you know, so I never even looked at this as an opportunity situation or as a, you know, something that could change something for me. I just was honored to be even a part of their vision, you know, for the yeah. mic drop. I definitely think it's dope to go back and highlight the people that came before us. Uh, it's been, well, I guess on a personal level, it's, it's been amazing. I've grown so much just being around, you know, these OGs and learning so much from them. You know, uh, I think a lot of times that's one part that we miss as younger artists, we don't really take the time to go, you know, learn from the people that came before us. So, you know, it's been, it's been eye opening in that sense, for sure. You know, what you just said, why do you think that, like, is it just because like in an artist mind, they're just like, all right, um, I'm about me. My generation makes the best music. I know best. This is what we're doing. I don't need no OGs. Like, what, right. what do you, what do you think's like the mindset of the current generation of artists that that kind of always makes them like a little bit cocky? My mom, my daddy can't tell me nothing because they don't know what I'm going through. Type vibe. You know what I'm saying? I think that that dynamic is still present. You know, even in this. You know, they're like, man, when y'all was doing it, it was a lot different. But they don't understand. You know, is that it was different, but it was still similarities there. You know, we're using a book that's thousands and thousands of years old. And the things in that book still apply to things that we go through today. You know what I'm saying? The book of the Bible. It's things still apply today. How does that even make sense? So what we can do is take principles, you know, back from what they used to do. Principle from this, principle from that, this example, and then switch it and apply it to our current situation. You know, I think there's, it's just a gap there where we think, you know, people who did it before us, since it wasn't as successful and as big and as massive as we think, you know, we don't really want to reach back. Or the other thing is we think that it's a, uh, you can age out. So once you age out, you know what I'm saying, it, you're not important anymore because you've aged out. But thank God for technology. Even people, you know, finna be 50. I talked to Chili. He finna be 50, but he finna drop another album because there's some more 50 year olds out there that still love his music, that still listen to his stuff. So, you know, we can learn from both of each other. We can all come together and like rock it out. So yeah, I've been learning a lot. You know, you got a, a approach to be in this film almost, well, like five years ago already. Yeah. So from five years ago until now, like what what has changed for you? And, and was there anything that you were doing, you know, back then that you were aspiring to do that you're now, you know, able to do? So, um, so when I was approached with this, I was still, to be honest, still just put on the gas as much as I could. And so one the things that have changed the most is just my strategy has changed. You know, I've become a little bit more open-minded to different strategies. Initially, it was just hard work, hard work, hard work, hard work, you know, and then I'm realizing as I go, got older that you know, hard work won't always do it. Talent won't always do it. There are different elements, you know what I'm saying, that you need to add, you know, to what you do to even bring value to the table. And so I started building a team around me, getting people around me that believed in the vision that God gave me. And we just start running. So over time, it's just grown and grown and grown, you know, and we're one song away from going crazy. So like the, the biggest difference was, was literally just, the amount of content that we've created over the last four or five years when they approached me about it you know what i'm saying dallas is like dallas is like one of the biggest cities for chh but it ain't a lot of artists out of chh that make it to a, a notable level you know what i'm saying it's either lecrae triple e you know what i'm saying uh tadashi because they from the north texas area or nobody else you know, so, you know, when I was approached with it, I was like, bro, I got to I got to hit up Street Hymns because he going crazy. I got to hit up Shot Speaks because she going crazy. Like at that point, we was going, we was all just going stupid. You know what I'm saying? But Dallas is, is like a big mecca. And so we've all, all of our careers has evolved and matured. And now I'm able to, you know, do ticketed events. Now I can go places and, you know, people will know the words to my song. That was, that's brand new. 
You know what I'm saying? People knowing the whole verses, not just the, the turn up hook or the part you teach. But people DMing me, telling me that my music is changing their lives and they were gonna commit suicide. And then they heard this song, I Know Who I Am. It reminded them of who they were in God. Like all those things, you know, those are the big differences that I've seen. When, yeah. when people look back on your generation of CHH, like in 30 to 40 years from now, just like we're doing with Mic Drop 30 to 40 years ago, you know, what, what would you want this, this, you know, next Mic Drop generation of, you know, the 2010s to 2020s, whatever, what, what would you want people to see um, reflected in that? I, I would want them to see the infiltration into every aspect of the world. You know what I'm saying? Like Christian, Christian uh, rap, initially was like here and then it started to triple out but right now it's everywhere we in video games we in movies we i mean we everywhere so i want them to in 10 20 years when they look back to be like man that was the first song they got on netflix that was the first song they got on madden 2021 that was the first song man that that sparked the revival man that was that was on the same stage with little baby or they was doing the same they was at coachella singing you know christian music to the top of their lungs like, that's what I want to see in the next 10 years. You know what I'm saying? Like, we're going into big places because of the power that comes with what we do, like the the, the, the anointing that comes with what we do, that we get in these big spots and still wreck shop no matter where we go.